Hello everyone, my name is Rick Liskey and I'm the director of the Data Collaboration Center at the Critical Path Institute. And I and my colleague Deborah Hanner are going to talk about the CPATH Data Collaboration Center and how we're sharing data among many different parties and how that's having a global impact. Uh, Deborah's going to talk a little bit about how it's actually impacted the TB community. Um, for those who aren't familiar with CPATH, we are an independent nonprofit organization dedicated to bringing scientists from regulatory agencies, uh, academia, um, industry, all together to collaborate in order to accelerate the development of new drugs and novel therapies um, and help improve the regulatory processes for medical devices and medical products. Um, we do this by forming consortia uh, and uh, we currently lead or co-lead 12 different consortia dedicated to advancing drug and device development pathways in several different therapeutic areas. One of the common elements for e that's, that's a requirement for each of these consortia in order to reach their goals is the need to share data. And that's the genesis of the Data Collaboration Center. The DCC was formed to provide access to large amounts of pooled data from many different sources in order to generate new insights and discoveries um, that aren't apparent when a single stakeholder is only looking at a single study or a single uh, clinical trial. Uh, the DCC provides a secure, neutral, non-competitive environment where members can uh, collaborate, share expertise, build consensus, um, and achieve results that benefit everyone who, who participates in that consortia. Uh, C CPATH and the DCC provide scientific, technical, and operational support uh, for each of these collaboration products, but probably the, uh, the biggest benefit that we provide or the most significant service that we provide is the curation, quality checking, um, standardization, and aggregation of these various data sets um, that are contributed that allow multiple, multiple data sets from many different areas to be uh, aggregated and analyzed by researchers and scientists. So, Kind of going along with what Mara had talked about earlier, the key to the success of the Data Collaboration Center is really the people who participate in the, in the um, projects, the various projects that we support. That includes the stakeholders and collaborators from all areas of the medical and research fields, um, member organizations who provide expertise, help set the direction for uh, the consortia goals, um, and also provide funding. Um, it includes the scientists that perform the analysis, uh, develop new tools, um, disease progression models, discover new biomarkers, and, and other new drug discoveries. Um, and then it also includes the CPATH staff, where we, over the last 10 years, we've built a level of expertise um, to help support all these different data collaboration efforts. Um, but the fund fundamental element for all these data collaboration projects is the data. Um, the DCC currently supports projects that span several different therapeutic areas. Um, and we're adding more, it uh, seems like, almost monthly. Uh, this includes data from over 80 clinical trials, uh, representing almost 50,000 uh, patients, and it also includes uh, clinical data from, or sorry, data from over 100 non-clinical trials. Um, our platform has well over 100 million data points currently. We're probably getting close to 200 million, um, and for, for those who, uh, work with spreadsheets, that's like 200 million cells in a, in a spreadsheet. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the actual technology that makes up the Data Collaboration Center. Oh, I'm not sure what happened there. Um, so this is a high-level rendering of a typical DCC data platform architecture. And if you start at the left here, we receive several different data types, um, and they can come in many different formats, um, come from many different sources. Um, and we take that data and curate it. We review it with the contributors to make sure that it contains all the data elements necessary to perform the analysis that, that align with the goals of that research project. Um, we also store all the, the um, CRF metadata, uh, anything else that had that reference data, anything else that's provided by a contributor or anything else that we generate uh, in order to transform that data into a standardized format that can be analyzed by researchers. Uh, 
all co contributed data is stored in its original format, so if we ever need to go back to the source data, we have it, we can recreate the, the standardized um, data if necessary. And that the funnel diagram in the middle of this slide represents the processes and the programming that goes on to transform this originally contributed data into a standardized format that can then be aggregated uh, and analyzed by researchers and scientists in order to achieve new insights uh, that wouldn't be available if they were just looking at a single data set. The investigational database towards the right here is where all that standardized data is aggregated and made available to users. And then finally, off to the far right, you'll see a little icon of a researcher and a little lock icon. And this represents the uh, data access framework that's in place to control access to the data within the platform. And we can do, we can, in some cases, a contributor may want to make data available only to specific researchers or member organizations. In some cases, they want to make it available to the entire public. And so with the data access methods for the, within the platform, we can actually control access to an individual element with, within the investigational database, or if the contributor allows it, we can actually provide access to the uh, originally contributed data if they need to go back to the source for some reason. Um, and then all this, the platform, the, uh, Platform exists today in a cloud um, architecture that we run on Amazon Web Services. It could be any cloud service. So, so the cloud infrastructure provides the security, the application isolation, the caching, the load balancing, um, and we can configure this depending on the needs of any data project in order to uh, provide the level of uh, performance or security or backup or whatever that we need to for that project. Uh, now I'd like to turn it over to Deborah, who's going to describe how this technology is being used in the real world to address the TV community. Thank you. So the intention of the Data Collaboration Center that Rick just described to you is really to help us to enable global data sharing efforts, and that's certainly the case. Uh, for the tuberculosis program, which I'm proud to lead at the Critical Path Institute on behalf of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, this large public-private partnership has a very broad aim to accelerate the development of novel combination therapies for the treatment of tuberculosis and also to drive the development of drug susceptibility tests and diagnostic to support the deployment of those new drugs to the patients who most need them. We can't make these kind of advancements in the global health space if we don't have the data to drive the development of new methodologies. The data platform effort within the TB program is one of our most advanced and is one that has evolved a great deal over the past five years. We started with a data collaboration center really focused on contemporary clinical trial data that would be shared only within the consortium itself to drive some of these new methodologies that I just described. But over time, some of the stewards of those data, namely the Centers for Disease Control, um, also the World Health Organization, realized that there would be a greater utility if globally there was access by the TB research community to these data. So they asked us to customize our approach and make those adiv data available over time. I want to tell you about two of our most exciting projects that we've launched over the past two years. Um, the first is our relational sequencing tuberculosis data platform. This is a first-in-class platform that allows us to integrate whole genome sequence level data, phenotypic data, and patient outcome data wherever possible from isolates across the globe into this centralized data platform. Right now that data is made accessible to those who donated and contributed data, also to our consortium members, but in the next year and a half it will be globally accessible. I'm very proud to share with you a press release that our team has put together that was released just on Monday for a data platform that we call TB Packs, the aggregation of TB clinical trial data. This is a collaboration between the Critical Path Institute and the World Health Organization. There are three, and only three, phase three clinical trials that have been concluded for new TB therapies in the last 40 years. 
those data have a really important function now in the TB community to educate us on how to better design clinical trials because the sad truth of these stories is that they're all failed trials. It's a very expensive failure and it's terrible for patients, one and a half million dying every year from this disease. So we're making these data available to our consortium to have lessons learned but also to the broader research community. So we talk about not just being a repository for data, but making those data useful. So I'll just give you a very quick example of some of the project work we do within the TB program to make those data useful. So we're working with teams from various academic institutions, National Institute of Health, contract research organizations to develop tools that don't exist today now to enable better clinical trials for tuberculosis. So a majority of these are in silico modeling and simulation tools, sophisticated methodologies that help you design clinical trials, simulate them before you enroll patients and, and um, conduct those trials. These are, these are tools that are available for a lot of uh, therapeutic areas that are critical to the developed world, but the TB community is very behind, and so our consortium is building these tools for the first time because we have access to the data in the, the Data Collaboration Center within CPATH. Critical Path Institute itself has several areas of how these data collaboration programs have created impact beyond just the tuberculosis therapeutic area. We have a number of programs where we have qualified or gotten some form of regulatory authority endorsement for things like uh, polycystic kidney disease, Alzheimer's disease, and others. We work with our partners at CDIS to develop therapeutic area user guides for uh, data standards. All of that is lots of fancy terminology to say there's a standard format to collect clinical trial data for clinical trials. Hugely important if you want to make those data useful. We've moved forward two first-in-class modeling and simulation tools, one for Alzheimer's, one for polycystic kidney disease. I promise that TB will be closely coming behind. And our data collaboration center has been accessed by researchers in over 60 countries. So I'll end with a parting thought that our data collaboration center is really intended to enable, as I said, global data sharing collaboration to make these data useful to researchers, to drug developers, to clinicians in some cases in the TB work, that the customizable feature is incredibly important. Being able to mean a curated, sustainable data platform is something that is really important to the Critical Path Institute and providing all the infrastructure and framework to keep those data, which are patient level data, protected and secure is our primary focus. Rick and I are happy to answer questions at the networking break. Thank you. <laughs>